where we are trying to encourage as many local um, contractors to be part of that whole movement into the digital era. Welcome back to another episode of Digital Innovations in Oil and Gas. On this week's episode, I'm in conversation with uh, Hamlin Holder, who is an adjunct lecturer with the University of the West Indies and a site reliability engineer with Methanex, which is one of the big uh, natural gas uh, uh, industries in Trinidad, along with many other uh, industries in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, we all might know it as a vacation spot, but in the world of oil and gas, it's actually a pretty big global player. And uh, uh, so today we're going to talk about the challenges of the, uh, uh, the oil and gas community in the West Indies faces, similar to those around the world, related to uh, workforce, workforce upskilling and preparation uh, for the future of oil and gas coming at us all very quickly. So uh, with that, let me welcome uh, Hamlin to the podcast. Hamlin, welcome to uh, Digital Innovations in Oil and Gas. Thank you, Jeffrey. Glad to be here. Well, let's uh, let's crack open this though uh, first with a bit about your our background, uh, you know, and how you how you ended up in this industry and uh, what you're currently doing. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so glad to be here. Um, so my my journey initially started in telecommunications for local uh, telecommunications company uh, right. TSTT yeah. at that time, and then I jumped across and you know getting into the the technology. I really wanted to pursue something either in electrical or mechanical. So that's where I, I, I started a diploma and went all the way up to doing a diploma in electrical. And then I said, let me do a degree. And I chose mechanical instead. So I kind of have a mix of, of backgrounds. Um, and then while on my journey, um, uh, this is all about 15 to 20 years ago, <laughs> um, somebody would have asked me, hey, you, you m might make a good uh, teacher. <laughs> so I, when I um, was pursuing my engineering, I was also kind of teaching part-time, more on a voluntary basis. And then um, after I graduated, I started to work for um, our local oil and gas companies, um, which was National Petroleum. Then I moved on to um, another oil and gas company, which would have been um, Neil and Massey Wood Group. Um, and they had a, one of the major contracts for offshore platforms. So started to work offshore for quite a bit and um, still teaching on odd occasion and expanding my uh, education and teaching portfolio. And then uh, eventually um, left offshore and came downstream into um, the methanol production. Um, and while working with the university and pursuing my master's, the university said, hey, you look like good stock to, <laughs> to um, you know, present the, the information. And um, I've been teaching in the University of the West Indies for, it's almost 10 years now, I, I think, um, in, you know, condition monitoring and reliability engineering, etc. So it's been a journey. Yeah. Um, um, and, you know, just being here in the Caribbean and, and seeing the different perspectives. It's, uh, the, uh, uh, a little bit about uh, Methanex and methanol uh, might, might be helpful. Mm -hmm. People might not be familiar with this, uh, but uh, sure. Methanex, big, big company, global company. Yeah. yeah, one of the largest, probably the largest uh, producers of uh, methanol in the world. Yeah. Um, they have sites Gigantic. in over six areas. Um, and basically, yeah. they, they would take the, the natural gas yeah. and, you know, through um, chemical processing, make what we call methanol. Yeah. It's not methane. They would take the methane and turn it into methanol. Um, but methanol is uh, one of those unique chemical um, that has a wide range of functionalities and uses. So it's, it's used for plastics, paints. It's in almost um, all of your household products. So there's a, yeah. a real essential demand globally for it. And, um, and methanol um, has been produced by Metanex over the decades. Um, we have two plants here um, that uh, produce uh, methanol and that's shipped all over the world. I didn't know there were two plants. I, I, that's, uh, that's a big story because there's a lot of natural gas in, um, in the country and uh, yes. liquefied natural gas too exported if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And is there an offshore yeah. oil industry to, co to accompany the uh, gas focus or is it uh, mostly gas? 
Right. So, yeah, that's a little bit of history. Um, so the, the viewers could understand, you know, yeah. what's going on in the Caribbean and, and um, uh, for the different stakeholders. So um, we have throughout the Caribbean uh, a few countries that have um, um, are involved in oil and gas, particularly. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the first uh, nascent um, providers would have been uh, Trinidad and Tobago, which is where yeah. I am at. Yeah. Um, that that was probably in the 1900s since the discovery, mm -hmm. and just looking at the timeline, as uh, they have been off and on searches for oil in different locations. Yeah. Soon after, I think Venezuela started to um, get some discoveries. Uh, after that, um, uh, coming down to the 1960s, there about 70s, mm. uh, a shift was taken to look at downstream. So. We did do a lot of offshore drilling, yep. and now we wanted to do some downstream and processing. We had the refinery called um, Petrotrin, um, and uh, we would have refined um, petroleum products and, and so on. Mm -hmm. And it's only until recently, uh, I would say like you know, 2015, there was another discovery, for, uh, a big discovery, I should say, uh, from Guyana. Um, there's also uh, a lot of um, work being done in Suriname as well. Um, but these are more, you know, upstreams. They probably have FPSOs, just, um, you know, uh, getting the uh, ref um, getting the natural gas, well, the oil, oil out yeah. of the ocean and stuff like that. But no, Trinidad has really progressed, I would say, into having both upstream and downstream. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that's basically a synopsis. I mean, you have other places. Jamaica is still exploring, um, and they're looking for to actually sink a drill um, and, uh, and take a look at it. Mm. I think Barbados has, has had, and but it may also just be, you know, for the local economy. Um, but Trinidad is by far, um, yeah. well, has no. the longest, <laughs> longest um, stake in the game. And now, yeah. you know, we have our, our brothers in Guyana and Suriname also stepping up um, with some huge findings. So yeah. it's good. Yeah, Guyana in particular, this is uh, in the media in North America because of the merger activity in the United States. The, uh, these discoveries are uh, the topic of, of uh, <laughs> negotiations between the, the, the majors in their acquisition programs. So yeah, these are, these are names that people sh will, will start to hear and, and uh, there's a reason why. Definitely. But you're, you're right in the middle of it, so this is good to talk about this. Uh, so let's turn to the question around the the uh, workforce uh, challenges. Mm -hmm. You know the the workforce in in the Caribbean uh, also uh, it, you know you want to participate in a global industry like oil and gas. You have to be you know, safe and reliable and and uh, uh, competent uh, players. So you have to maintain a high level of workforce uh, capacity and capability. Um, how do you how do you do this in in a it's, it's one thing to you know you're in Houston and send your <laughs> send your workforce to a you know a community college yeah. or a school or what have you but but the Caribbean different problem here we're very spread out uh, small economies yeah. relatively few people high cost potentially mm -hmm. how do you educate uh, the workforce what are the challenges there yeah um, it's it's not something that is done overnight. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's something that uh, took a transition um, over the years, I would say, um, to get us to where Trinidad and Tobago is, because we would have, have had to transition from other sectors in the economy, like agriculture. Oh, of course. Yeah. Um, remember, yeah, before oil and gas was probably sugar cane and, and um, sugar and, and different um, citrus and so on. Yeah. So, you know, we had to now, you know, reskill into this new engineering, which is, you know, a high learning curve in some areas. Mm -hmm. um, but over the years, you know, but generationally, the younger generation would have been sent into the schools and, you know, to come out as engineers, not farmers and so on. Mm -hmm. So there are some pros and cons to that, of course. <laughs> um, but we'll talk about, you know, hey, the next generation of engineers. I think what is, is uh, some of the challenges uh, and just looking back is, you know, um, getting that knowledge transition um, carried forth from, you know, long-standing producers um, from the U.S., the U.K., and so on. Mm. And, uh, you know, carrying that knowledge. And then there's some other challenges around intellectual property oh, of, of, course, yeah. of being yeah. able to, you know, find certain methods of, um, of drilling, um, yeah. refining, and so on. Um, but by and large, I think where we are now, 
um, what helps is, is we are in this information age, which is putting almost everything out there, you know, compared to, you know, when I was probably now starting to understand engineering, um, the knowledge is, is so much more present and, you know, uh, uh, and unavailable. Mm -hmm. So there are some differences, some unique differences, which I'm, I'm sure we're going <laughs> to jump into. Yeah, um, I, to the this, day. yeah, this this uh, I think is really important. Uh, the the idea that uh, there's a, a kind of sovereignty over knowledge, and uh, uh, it can be used as a uh, um, uh, a, a tool for uh, uh, industrial advancement in a very localized and protected area is kind of false. Uh, the the, the yeah. uh, these engineering disciplines are are global. Uh, may, maybe you know uh, the sanctions on on the high tech industry um, in over Taiwan uh, for, over the chip manufacturing in China might you, know, you might argue that that industrial knowledge is something you can protect, but for oil and gas that's just not the case. The, the, it's a truly global yeah. industry, and so the, the knowledge yeah. base is not something you can you can kind of harbor for yourself. Okay. And and in addition to that, also, it's um, we are driven by standards and codes. So yeah, of course. Um, it's making and changes and stuff. Yeah, they have to be global. So, um, you know, this whole region of innovation is, is going to be at odds with standardization, yeah. <laughs> which says, hey, we have learned from the past. And, and most times we learn from incidents. And this is the new standard. We have to do it play by play. Don't don't deviate. Yep. Um, so you have to love, learn and adopt. But then as the plants or the assets ages, there's a, a new desire for innovation, new materials required and, and stuff like that. So there's that's that's some of the conflicts that uh, we see coming day to day yeah. with the whole um, industry right now. Yeah. So how, how actually is uh, this uh, knowledge transfer carried out uh, in, in, in training and upskilling? I, I mean, in, in North America, m a great deal of what people learn about the industry takes place at training courses and conferences put together by uh, uh, vendors, uh, say. Uh, is, the, is there a parallel here in, in the Caribbean or is it done in some other fashion? Um, it's, it's both, it's kind of a hybrid. Um, uh, it's always that, uh, how to put it, that clash of, of experience versus academics. Um, I would say, by and large, the majority of workforce actually um, gets skilled through, you know, training, um, uh, training agencies uh, via the government and so on. Um, but then you have the, the higher order of engineering mm -hmm. and, um, you know, calculations and design and stuff like that where you have to, you know, really go through a uh, university uh, type degree and so on to, to be classified. One, one of the things just talking on the university side is that, mm -hmm. well, the university tries to provide as wide a scope, but there's so many unique esoteric areas that um, maybe in particular um, fields within oil and gas yeah. that may not be provided. Yeah. So, at the University of the West Indies, for sure, we try to cover, you know, the basic ones, the asset management, um, planning, um, scheduling, you know, maintenance, uh, quality, uh, total quality management and, and the core stuff to run a business and the business sectors. But also it's an opportunity for others to just carry on and specialize in those areas. But we don't, you won't find an aeronautical engineering <laughs> degree, <laughs> right, uh, yeah. at the university as yet. Um, or specialized areas in, in uh, maybe nanoscience and so on. Yeah. But uh, you, you would brush upon it. And, um, and that's, that's the, the goal for the University of the West Indies, I guess. Now what about the, the newer digital domains? Um, and here I'm thinking about application development, app development on, uh, on mobile devices, cloud computing. Uh, robotics and drone technology. These these are also widely available um, uh, as uh, as intellectual property, uh, so they're not proprietary. Uh, is, how, how is the Caribbean um, uh, educational economy? How is it addressing these areas? I mean, is uh, uh, they're not exactly aeronautics, like super narrow and niche, uh, but still they're fast evolving and quite specialized. Yes, and um, I, we are trying to keep a pace, uh, to be honest, from mm. my personal perspective. 
um, and trying to get it into the curriculum and, and yeah. even uh, give an opportunity for the younger, the very young generation um, coming into what we call primary schools or kindergarten and stuff um, to be able to understand what is this new technology is about. And with, with all change, there's, you know, this apprehension, <laughs> there's a, a, a need for management of the change and yep. awareness uh, for all the individuals involved in it. Um, the University of the West Indies has been pioneer. I remember when I now started, there was uh, now, don't one date of my... Don't yourself here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't want to sell too much out right now, but, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, one of my co-lecturers, he was doing his PhD uh, similar to what um, uh, Elon Musk was doing, and that was yeah. uh, some years ago, yeah. um, to actually um, use the, the brain to control things through robotics. And um, so it's there for like, uh, if you want to go at the very high level, but we want to bring that from PhD down to masters. Yep. And and I think our goal, if you look at it in the next five years or so, would be to ingrain that into everything. <laughs> so it doesn't matter whether it be um, engineering, um, marketing, we need to have AI as part of the curriculum. Yep. And that that is going to start and probably even start at what we call our um, secondary schools, um, right, which is right after primary. We uh, at Metanex, we do uh, quite a bit of um, community work introducing people to um, apps, applications. Oh. But we, we there, there's quite a bit of promise. A lot of the information is really self-taught, I wouldn't say, but also it's it's self-gained, not self-taught, because yeah. the information is out there. You have so many avenues, Udemy and Coursera, and a lot of things available to teach. You know, coding, low coding, Python. Uh, you can teach yourself, really and truly. So, but it's always good to have that. You know, experience through certification and and the university. So, yeah, um, it's making its way. Um, those what I call the, the the top eight or ten. You know, robotics. Uh, mechatronics, you know, that, as you mentioned, data management, um, how do we deal with, you know, blockchains and, and processing capabilities of the GPUs as it is right now. Yeah. Um, detection in, in oil and gas, that's a big focus area because we need to inspect um, piping, bridges, things that we can't access. And we need to use the onslaught of all the available technologies, infrared, UV, ultrasonic, um, to be able to detect, um, you know, damage mechanisms, failure modes, so that we can prevent it. And of course, you know, um, lower bottom line and in terms of saving costs and, and preventing disastrous um, incidents. Yeah. And then of course, now we have other things coming up in the pipeline, things like simulation, you know, digital twinning, um, uh, to, to just basically project and um, predict quite a bit. Uh, and, and uh, as well, material science, and, and and then there's a whole area now that we have to accommodate, which is the whole climate and sustainability. Of course. So, yeah. how do we look at that transition um, from oil and gas into you know what the future holds with um, generating energy? Yeah, it's the uh, carbon and energy transition, the new energy economy, are not. Yeah unique to North America or the OECD economies. Everywhere is dealing with this. And I suspect Correct. Caribbean economies uh, are you know, close to the equator. Uh, yeah. Many of the islands uh, are challenged with the uh, climate change because of the, the more intense weather systems, uh, rising sea levels. So it's, it's really right in the, uh, unfortunately, it's right at the heart of, of uh, sustainability and survivability for, for the island economies. So. Uh, it's, uh, if, in case people are listening to this, thinking, "Oh, you know, the people people in small economies aren't thinking about this." No, no, no they're thinking about it, they're taking it very seriously. Yeah, d definitely. Um, now, Trinidad, uh, the Caribbean culture. You know, yeah. I'll, I'll step forward and speak a little bit about it. It's a little different from what you might see as an industrial metropolitan oh. okay. type. Uh, we, we, from what I see, it's a, a balance of um, leisure and. Um, and work, you know, and, and studiousness and steadfastness to yeah. get the job done. Uh -huh. So um, we always try to find, we always have a kind of blend in our own culture. 
in terms of you know the workforce and sometimes people get frustrated with it yeah <laughs> sometimes people understand it that you know hey why are we pushing so hard to to damage the, the climate you know so i think we are going to find our own of course we need to do something urgently and start to get involved as soon as possible and get ahead of the curve is what i call it yeah. with with renewables and and sustainable technologies climate resilience and um, that is definitely where i think we could add our value and our perspective our voice yeah. um, in terms of the technology and don't let the the technology just you know come at us you know but be part of the development of it yeah well, it's, it just underscores the changes, right? It's uh, this this whole co climate challenge, uh, adoption of these new technologies, the rise of digital, the the gap between uh, today's workforce and tomorrow's workforce looks pretty pretty uh, significant. How big is that gap? Do you do you think, or is it? Are, I know you're working hard to close it. Uh, I think the, right. one of the challenges the the frontier keeps racing on ahead. So how do you how do you catch up? Uh, is probably the probably the challenge. Yeah, I, I, where there's opportunities and challenges, um, uh, there, there will be innovation, right? And I, I think this is where we are, are going to see um, the discretizing and digitalizing uh, coming um, to the forefront. Yeah. And, um, and once there's a, a more economical way for, for there to um, have innovation, they're going to have, we have a little siren going off. I don't know if you're hearing. No, um, nope, can't no, 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 it's, it's, just, a, it's just a, a drill. Oh. So once they have um, uh, this energizing of education, yeah. um, what we're seeing is that we may not be able to um, put a lot of capital to change an entire plant, but during the upgrades, there's some room for innovation. And, and I know some of your your past podcasts would have spoke about STOs and turnarounds and shutdowns. Yes. And those are some of the key areas we, especially the university in terms of turnaround planning, seek to um, uh, inculcate what, a, what should be done during our upgrade. Yeah. Uh, a big challenge as well is this whole thing about obsolescence <laughs> and um, that's also an opportunity because now you could, you know, revise your electrical systems, um, revise your your circuitry, your your coding and stuff like that. So mm. um, we do need to move from, you know, rig to renewables as well. So there's a lot of learning uh, in that aspect um, of of how we could use, you know, the sunlight and their courses we are now offering yeah. in the university as well to get and upskill the local. Uh, local uh, workforce so there's quite a, a bit of areas for us to make that that um, that transition yeah and i think uh, trinidad and tobago being blessed with you know warm weather lots of sunshine and plenty of of uh, methane yeah. you actually the economies could become hydrogen leaders uh, at some point down the down the track is this a topic of conversation amongst the uh, the industrial uh, uh, companies in in the in the country uh, to to, uh, to to do this transformation of, of uh, hydrogen to uh, or natural gas to hydrogen, or is it or is the economy? I mean, it's, you're doing very very well, obviously, with methanol manufacturing. So it might be an argument that says, don't worry about hydrogen. Let's just stick with what we know. How, how's that playing out? No, I I think our government is actively looking at um, options from moving from probably to doing the transition from blue hydrogen to green hydrogen where yeah. it's totally green um, with all of these things you know the, the, the pro it's again I, I like to look at the conflicts so the conflicts is uh, or the conflicts are mm -hmm. there's a, a large capital investment needed yep. um, for a low sample point of, of success and and the thermodynamics and understanding of, of being able to produce hydrogen at this point in time, um, you know, the confidence level may not be, be there to actually make it at the, the right amount uh, of, of capital investment to get that return on investment. Yeah. Um, so that science is new as well. And again, you know, there's apprehension for it. We are, we are looking at, um, of course, making that transition. Uh, we do, as you mentioned, you know, make things like methanol, uh, ammonia, yeah. um, LNG, 
um, we do have quite a bit of value streams and with the we do have a, a depleting uh, reserve so we do want to make a nice smooth segue and transition into some of the uh, greener solutions like uh, like hydrogen yeah. um, our, our situation is always a, a little different from my perspective because a lot of our energy is actually done for cooling as opposed to heating ah, <laughs> um, that's true. as for yeah. other, other um, nations yeah so on once on the one um, standpoint you could look at hey can i supply the energy or could i reduce the amount of energy needed to cool mm. and so they may have other ways to look at you know um, um making that climatic um innovative um yeah. leap um not just in in it but we are looking at, at hydrogen um quite a bit of discussion but again it's is is it in the early phases is it proven yeah. um and what's the payback period that's those are the uh, sort of discussions that need to be had yeah well, and of course the the reality is uh, as a producer you need an off taker someone who will take the Correct. product and and is prepared to put money up front in the form of a long contract to say if you supply it i'll buy it at this price for this period of time and that then gives you the capital Correct. strength to go and invest in it but where's the off takers <laughs> until, we, until yeah. we see them there's it's, not much there you could, no matter how, how good the engineering is you still need to watch the market <laughs> you still yeah. need to bow down to what the market um is is about and and um, what where the supply and demand is and yeah. where your competitors are so in terms of pricing so oh, there are so yeah. many forces there are, there are indeed and and uh so, but so this but does underscore though that at least from my vantage point the the outlook for the uh, um, trinidad and tobago energy economy uh, uh, is is in is in very good shape. There's high demand for natural gas. That's not going to go yeah. away anytime soon. Plus, the country has other energy resource possibilities: uh, blue hydrogen, green hydrogen, uh, being yeah. among those. And of course, there's whole materials sciences evolving, which take advantage of uh, molecules that the island has <laughs> in abundance. Yeah. So yeah, it's a, it's it's it's, um, it's very positive. Let's, let's turn to this question though about uh, uh, digital tools and technologies. Uh, right. the, you know, at the same time as you need the industrial engineers to do build, op operate, and run plants, uh, there is this wave of digital innovation that you know you definitely want to take advantage of. How do you? How is this uh, this skilling happening? Is this a uh, uh, again, uh, uh, university driven, highly specialized, or are you, is it like North America where it's, you know, we're seeing this now in the, in the grade school system. And, and so you know, young people are becoming, you know, effectively digitally native from, from birth. Um, one way or the other, it's, it's here. Yeah. Um, the, the young ones are, are getting into it, but you need to have them specialized and, and in a certain focus area. You know, it's, it's not just, you know, um, giving somebody a, a, a device or iPad or Kindle, yeah. you know, it's, it's the ability for them to understand how it works yeah. and, um, and how to make, uh, how to make others and reproduce, uh, the university of the West Indies is looking at different, a uh, wide scale and, and we do from computer engineering and stuff like that to, to bring that. But of course that is uh, very close to the working force. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think we, we need uh, more STEM, what we call, you know, science, uh, technology, engineering, yeah, maths, maths. Um, and yeah, and those type of programs at the, the younger um, ages. Um, and then of course, very diversified, not just in the male schools, but if you, you know, the, yeah. the young girls as yep. well, yeah, yeah. Um, give them the opportunity to to learn about you know the technology that's coming um for, for for me you know i am i'm a core maintenance person so um i like the science of maintenance and we need that here because we we may not put down a large capital asset for uh, not not as much as we would have put down in terms of you know um building and projects mm -hmm. since the the 19 you know 80s um, 2000s and so on so now it's about maintaining so that's where the science of it um, to bring down your your um, your outlook your financial outlook in terms of how much you're spending on maintenance your failures your loss of production that's where um, as you mentioned you know using the AI and stuff for the workforce needs to be embedded yeah. and um, 
and that's where we, we we have to learn you know how to use drones you know simple things like that to do inspection uh, the maintainability aspect of it um, the ability to conduct maintenance um, remotely right without having persons um, at risk and um, mm -hmm. and where does the the supplemental workforce now transition to support that not just the core engineering but you know the supplier supply chains the hsc yeah. what are the the health and safety aspects of it what are some of the um, the quality management the standards around digital innovation there's a whole body of um, knowledge that needs to be had so yeah. the university of the west indies um, is bringing that into it i know every year you will never see the same coursework from the year before i always i from about five years i would have started with big data yeah. uh, machine learning and now i'm bringing in even more into asset management um, uh, things like uh, ai and and uh, you know detection methods right because uh, the the science is getting so much more advanced than it would have been when you were reading these black and white pages in the <laughs> 1980s so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's it's yeah. Bad. yeah. I was gonna say it's it's a it's a a, a dramatically different time now, and uh, and I think your point about the uh, the the uh, the the observation is kind of obvious when you when you look at it. But the obvious uh, story here is a huge installed industrial base that's going to run for years. It has to be maintained, and at the same time, it has to be able to embrace and work with these 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 newer tools and. Uh, uh, the the idea that there will be uh, you know an, another huge wave of, of uh, capital expenditure on brand new plants uh, you can't wait for that you can't you can't pin your hopes on that you need you got to no. work with what you've got correct correct yeah. correct and uh, yeah. so um, in in all of that you have uh, uh, lots I'm assuming there's opportunities for people in the Caribbean if they want to work at the nexus of um, clean tech new and uh, new um, uh, digital innovation uh, the, the energy economy energy manufacturing both upstream and midstream it sounds like there's should be lots of work opportunity there yeah well we have to create it um, <laughs> and it's this is where we might leverage more on the opportunity entrepreneurial minds um, to you yeah. know fill that gap and uh, you know if if they need to partner with you know foreign entities and so on um, so be it but you know learn the technology get familiar because while we have you know these um, brownfield agent assets to maintain yeah. we're still looking at you know probably in the 15 years of you know depleted reserves and this is globally we we don't expect by 2050 onwards a whole lot of oil and gas so there will be a transition and of course we're trying to make it as smooth and you know as uh, well taught out as we can yeah um but that's where we come into now you know climate climatic solutions and and um, um going green so uh, carbon capturing, as you mentioned, you know, how do we manage that carbon cycle? Is it just, yeah. are we going to just bury it? You know, um, are we just going to, you know, um, do direct capture or maybe we could use it for something, you know, making um, structures, concrete, who knows? <laughs> uh, so this is where I think um, we need to really sit back uh, and and our workforce, um, well, if, if not driven by the government, but, you know, entrepreneurs can look at it the private sector could say hey i could support the oil and gas industry yeah. um let me come and do some some drone inspection let me come and um and uh, show you some automation that could um, um, lower your workforce and this is where we are trying to encourage as many local um, contractors to be part of that whole movement into the digital era well, I, it sounds really attractive, this, uh, this split between uh, l the leisure economy, the industrial economy, sunshine, beaches, yeah. hard work. <laughs> yeah, and a little bit of farming. And a little bit of farming, <laughs> exactly. Well, it should be, yeah. it would be so much fun. Uh, let me just close off uh, today, though, with uh, you know, if you, any, sure. any, uh, any observations or thoughts around the outlook for the oil and gas industry, what's, what's your perspective? Yeah, I, I think for me, I, I'll always push collaboration, you know, amongst um, gather the learnings. Uh, Trinidad has a long history. Um, we have some new um, bright up and comers um, 
in it um, as uh, the Caribbean is very small, right, compared to some of the the continents and, and so on. So yeah. we need to band together and share our knowledge as best possible. And, um, you know, the, the longer the vision, the smarter the action, you know. So once you <laughs> see further out, you could put better uh, things in place now. Yeah. And and when you look at the life of an uh, of, uh, asset, um, of a methanol plant, uh, ammonia plant, there are only a couple four-year turnarounds, five-year turnarounds until, you know, you may not have a feedstock supply. Yeah, so yeah. You, you have to utilize those opportunities when you and, can. Uh, when you can. Yeah. And that requires thought and collaboration and planning best practice that we need to do things our own way. You know, Trinidad and Guyana needs to come together where Suriname needs to share our learnings. Yeah. Um, you know, so that we could um, all benefit and um, see how the economy could be a little more intertwined um, rather than un interdependent. Yeah, it's a lovely vision and uh, would would be fantastic to see it come to fruition. Hamlin, th uh, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Thank you. No problem. A pleasure being here, Jeffrey. This has been another episode of Digital Innovations in Oil and Gas. On today's episode, a conversation with Hamlin Holder uh, all the way from Trinidad and Tobago on the topic of the energy economy in the Caribbean, the skills and jobs, digitalization, decarbonization. Tune in again next week for another episode. Bye for now.